Hi and welcome to this series where I'm going to be going through the ITIL 4 practices individually to give you the main headline points you need to be aware of in order to help you support your base knowledge around ITIL 4. I'll also discuss some of my real world application of these practices in the various organisations I've worked in. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, like, click the bell, you'll get the updates. Okay, so let's get to it. Today, I'm going to be covering off the service desk from the service management practice. Reminder about what a practice is. A practice is a set of organisational resources designed for performing work or accomplishing an objective. The purpose of a service desk is to capture demand for incident resolution and service requests. It should be the entry point and a single point of contact. I'll, re I'll stress that, a single point of contact for the service provider with all of its users. Over time, the service desk function has broadened um, away from, it's not just um, uh, simply log and flog, if you like, logging tickets and, and just resolving te technical issues. It's become a more encompassing type of activity, a more comprehensive offering for people and for the business as a whole. It's um, also being used um, as another approach of, of getting clarification on things or coordination of things, ex explanations. Um, so the, the scope is definitely widening and um, you, you'll hear the term service desk and you'll hear help desk mention, uh, mentioned and, and there, there's some subtle differences there that I'll come on to in a, in a quick moment. But a really important point around the service desk, it has a major element in terms of perceiving uh, uh, the, the service that's being offered. So users see the service desk, your, your, your customers are seeing the service desk as their um, first port of contact with you and the, like it or not, to a certain extent, how good is the service overall? So really bear that in mind. When you when you think about your service desk function, A, don't see it just purely as a technical uh, function. See it as this is a point, point of entry in, into your customer, into your stakeholders, and they will perceive how good you are based on their experience of the service desk function. So just a, a, a quick point around service desk and help desk. Generally, I like to think as a service desk fits more into the strategic side of things, whereas a help desk is a bit more, a bit more tactical, a bit more operational side of things. But certainly a service desk I see as more strategic uh, help desk that that term and it's maybe a little old-fashioned you know it's, people still use it but help desk is is a bit more kind of technical and it, and it's more from a tactical perspective the scope of a service desk is typically much wider it's more involved I, I would go as far as saying it's better than a than a help desk so the scope is another differentiator there between a service desk and a help desk think service desk is a much wider scope it's more involved help desk is is a is a smaller scope the the other way i like to think of what's the difference between a, a, a service desk and, a, and an it uh, help desk is a service desk tends to be exactly that it's much more service orientated the the, the clues in in the word service desk whereas help desk for me, always feels a little more IT opera orientated. It's, it's sort of operating IT. It's a it's an IT element, whereas service desk, um, just the general feel of it, it, it's more service orientated. So if we explore service desk a little more, it's a clear path. It needs to be a clear path for somebody to get help on 
any problems they have, maybe uh, they, they have a, a, an issue of some kind or they've got a question or a how do I, there's a query element to it, or perhaps a request, they, they need something, maybe they need a laptop, they need a phone, they need a mobile phone, they, they need access to something. It, it's a way that you need to uh, structure that there's an acknowledgement mechanism in there. So if somebody's asking for something, you need to set some kind of expectations as to the first point of, port of call is, yes, we've got your query. Yes, we've got your request. Yes, we've got your issue, your incident, wh whatever it may be. So do think about the acknowledgement element. Certainly in a lot of organisations I work in, there are service level agreements for the mean time to acknowledgement. So typically it will say something like 99% of the time we will respond within X amount of time, maybe 30 minutes or 30 seconds or, or whatever it is. But there needs to be an acknowledgement element to uh, somebody saying, I have a problem. The expectation is that it's going to be classified accordingly. It's going to be assigned to the right teams, the right assignment groups, the, the right uh, subject matter experts. And then the expectation is it will be actioned and it will be dealt with right through to resolution and closure. Notice there's two different elements there. There's resolution and closure. Typically in service management tools, you'll see resolution as, okay, it's, res it's resolved, but you can reopen it for up to say five days or three days afterwards until it's then automatically closed. So there's two elements there, just bear that in mind, resolution and closure. A big consideration is your CX and your UX. The perception of the service desk is representing your service overall. Service desks are, are a combination of people, there's, there's processes in there, there's automation, uh, increasingly self-service and, and, and bots. But regardless of how you do it, remember, it's about delivering value. If we think to the service value system, if we think to the service value chain, what's the end result of those products and services? It's value. So don't don't underestimate the, the importance of a service service desk. But but also don't rear don't don't fall into the trap of it's just lots of incidents or request numbers. Um, it's supporting real people with names. It's not just incident one, two, three, four, five, six. It's Dave from accounts. Now, clearly in larger organizations, that's more of a difficult challenge, but the, the underlying principle there is, don't forget you're delivering value and it's also about real people. So consider your UX, consider your um, user experience, your customer experience, and the perception that your service desk is is uh, providing. It's your front of house. Your service desk agents, they need to be particularly good at things like their, their service approach, their attitude. Empathy is, is another important thing. There's nothing worse than phoning a service desk and the person on the end of the phone is just not interested that it's just like i have no empathy here that's not great empathy really important they need to be good at communication they need to have a good level of emotional intelligence they need to be good listeners clearly there's a level of problem solving and depending on how technical your your desk is you're going to need different levels of of problem uh, solving ability but fundamentally they need to be able to understand they need to be able to take the correct action the appropriate action using a combination of processes people knowledge skills again the service desk is vital to the operation um, and your productivity in terms of the company overall don't underestimate that it is the heart of support operations Sometimes I, I, I think the service desk doesn't doesn't get a good deal and, and it is frontline. You are engaging with your users. It's really important that the, the, the phrase it's the face of the IT organisation couldn't be truer. It, it's, it's that first port of, of contact and first impressions do count. So it's critical to keep the service uh, um, for your users and your, your business processes running effectively. In some cases, 
The service desk doesn't necessarily need to be technical. Key elements there is people skills, customer experience. In fact, as, as, as I think, as a case in point, I recently um, employed somebody in a service desk capacity, but they actually weren't from, a, from an IT background. They were, they were from the business operational function of one of the customers that we were actually um, uh, uh, providing. So um, they were from the customer retention department and their key skills, it was all about people, it was all about customer service, it was all about retaining the, the, the experience somebody had um, and, and turning that around and, and making good on it. So that was just, a, 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 I suppose, a little example, really, where don't always think a service desk has to be technical. First line people, are, that, that individual really understood from a business perspective what it meant when, when an IT service wasn't working and wasn't um, actually executing and, and providing that level of support from the sharp end you know they'd been within those, those business departments within that business operational environment they understood the business in the widest context so they weren't just technical let's talk about channels and and just some general kind of thoughts and, and considerations here so the the typical ways people will contact contact a service desk they can just walk in they can phone there can be portals chatbots email text and social media walk-ins uh, just as an example and a, and a slight aside, I, I worked for a number of organisations where there was the, this concept of a tech bar. And what that meant was it was almost a drop-in clinic. So um, every Thursday and Friday, a uh, number of people from the service desk and from a number of subject matter expert towers were located in a particular office um, within uh, within uh, the the building and it was it was marketed as if you've got a problem with your IT come along come and see us drop in bring your laptop um, tell us what you you know tell us all your woes um, and that was really popular and, and it was a really good way of improving the uh, the perception of IT is that we were actively saying to people come to us tell us what your problems are not even necessarily knowing if people did have problems Whereas the service desk model is very much, I have a problem, I'm now going to engage with you. This was turning it, this drop-in clinic, this tech bar was turning it completely on its head. We said, come to us if you've got a problem. Um, clearly the service desk function was still there and it was a 24-7 arrangement. But these drop-in clinics, the, this whole concept of walk-in was there. Phone is always a common way of people using uh, uh, the, the channel to, to engage with the service desk. And typically you will see IVRs or voice recognition software. Portals, perhaps on your company intranet, uh, may be there in terms of providing a, um, a way of logging a incident or, or a service request, or even perhaps requesting something from, from the service request, or um, a catalog, or perhaps even an element of Here's a knowledge base, you know, sort of backending it to 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 a to a knowledge base somewhere where people could 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 help. Chatbots, emails, text, and and social media are are, are other ways of engaging with the service desk. As automation increases, AI, RPA, chatbots, that this is all moving towards the the self service approach of um uh, of not only logging tickets, so you're getting your customers, your your stakeholders, your users logging for you. There's an element of resolution in there as well. So perhaps the uh, the chatbot uh, references a knowledge base and is able to put forward a, a solution to say, have you, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Of course, the service provider will want to push this because they will recognise that there are savings to be made here. This is going to um, mean um that uh, the the service can be more efficient financially likewise the shrewd customer is going to recognize that as well in terms of hang on the cost to run the service desk is suddenly going to be less because you are putting ai in place because rpa because chat bots because of automation there's a definite 
emphasis on that shift left approach, moving the service closer to, to, the, the, to the customer. Responsibilities of a service desk in the, in the, the practice area, typically you're talking incidents and service requests, perhaps some disruption activity uh, along the lines of quality or availability. Maybe there's a major incident management element in there. Recent examples I can think of um, in terms of some of the other activities would be um, service requests involving passwords or, or account management, setting up people, making sure that they can log into the organization's IT systems and, and business systems. Not only the uh, sort of domain access, but access to other business systems, perhaps an ER, ERP um, system, for example. And then also there's, there's touch points in terms of configurations and change management and release management. So a service desk uh, ITSM tool, for example, may have a module that allows you to raise um, requests for changes interfaces so as we as we think through all of the ITIL for management practices so there's 34 practices there you've got general management practices you've got service management practices which is where the service desk is and then you've got the technical management practices so like with a lot of practices we've discussed there are interfaces there are connections there are, are there are elements where a particular practice will work with or be integrated or there'll be an interface of some kind that you just need to be aware of in terms of um, uh, how that operates in in the widest sense so service desk typically you're going to be involved in things like event and monitoring management there's an clearly incident management but if you extend that out there's also major incident management so where does that fit into in terms of bridges for example or communications to uh, um, to your user base certainly my experience of service desk and the incident management practice for major incident perspective is definitely around the communication piece um, uh, amongst many others but incident management would involve a level of communication so in the case of a major incident it may be the service desk are responsible for sending the major incident management comms out every 30 minutes every hour whatever it may be other incidents area uh, sorry other interfaces um, would be problem management service request access management if your ITSM tool has the the module and the interface you you'd want to interface it with your change management practice management reporting service level management of course knowledge man management as well broadly speaking in terms of types of service desk you you would have your local service desk that tends to be close to the user so maybe it's in the same building or the same locale or, or whatever it is you'll have a centralized model where you would introduce perhaps um, an extra layer of IVR in terms of your your, um, uh, your phone systems, maybe some call distribution activity, more complex workflows, resource planning tends to kick in in terms of maybe there's shifts here, maybe there's that this is sort of following the sun, or you know there's a there's an element of um, uh, different time zones and and shift patterns. Typically, greater activity around knowledge bases, QA and QC activity. So just making sure um, agents are, are, are really following the processes and the procedures. But also they have some of those soft skills as well. It's not always just hard skills. There's, there, there's soft skills. Empathy is a, is a good example there. Typically, from a, from a centralised model, you're, you're thinking more around remote access, remote tooling in order to connect to um, your user base that may be in different, uh, different countries, different regions. Maybe you're in APAC and, and um, you're supporting people in EMEA, as an example. I see a lot more activity around dashboards, monitoring and configuration management systems, typically in a, in a centralised model. And then your virtual approach, which is much more sophisticated. It's more complex. 
not unusual to see cloud-based solutions in there and, and technology needed and, and clever, clever routing. Some considerations generally, just in terms of the type of, of service desk. Think about the ITSM tool that, that you would use. Best of breed is usually a good idea. Consider languages. Are, are, you, are you supporting in one language? Are you supporting multiple languages? Clearly, you need to think about the tooling as well as the agents there. Knowledge base, accuracy of your knowledge base is so important to make sure there is that there's accurate information, not only for your users, but for agents on a service desk function to, to refer to. Um, call recording technology and capability is that interfacing into your ITSM tool, your telecoms, etc. Um, um, IVR, distribution. Um, the, the other elements around your ITSM tool, make sure you've got um, SLAs and escalations and, and workflows really thought through there. The, the workforce management to manage demand as well. Perhaps your organisation has uh, uh, periods of peak activity where you know it's really busy at, I don't know if year end just happens to be June for the sake of argument, does does the organisation have a huge peak in business uh, uh, business activity or is there a renewal season or you know is there some kind of activity when when um, uh, you might need to scale up agents or you may need to scale down agents and again think around remote management tools think integration as to how how's all of this go, going going to work um, and and operate all right if we move on to the service value chain the the SVC a quick reminder service value chain right at the center of the service value system service value system consists of guiding principles governance service value chain practices and continual improvement your service value chain is um the way i always remember it is PIDOD, which is its activities that you do to produce products and services which goes on to value PIDOD is plan improve engage design and transition obtain and build, deliver and support. So where does that fit into service desk? Like most activities, most practices, the, um, all of those activities are touched upon. However, in the service desk, it's that there is one exception and that's plan. So the PIDOD, plan, improve, engage, design tra and transition, operate and build, deliver and support, it's all of those except plan. The main concentration, though, of, of activity is in the engage, deliver and support area. That contributes most to the service value chain during those activities. If we move to reporting and metrics, measurement, governance and oversight, things I like to see um, in terms of how do you measure, how do you report, how do you govern, how do you provide oversight on a service desk, I, I like to see information around volumes, so incident volume and request volume, perhaps that's per quarter or per month. I always quite like to see a breakdown in terms of incident priorities. How many P0s, how many P1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s in a given month? Where's the majority of the work? <clears throat> Hopefully that data is going to show you you've got lots of 3s, 4s and 5s and not many P0s or, or P1s. Trending of incidents and service requests, volumes by month, provides really good information for periods of peak activity. So when you're thinking about resource planning, as an example, you can use this information for staffing up or staffing down, flexing your, uh, your resourcing levels. And that's both as an outsourcer and, and for internal teams. I always like to see the the um, the engagement uh, uh, methods, the source methods, how people engage with the service desk function. Is it phone? Is it email? Is it chat? Is it self service? You know, what are the volumes there? How many are coming in by phone as opposed to email, for the sake of argument? Clearly, things like self service portals are always areas that you want to try and improve because you're you're um, 
not only making the, the service more cost efficient, you're making it more customer friendly, as long as it is, um, as long as you've got your CX and your UX con considerations there. First time fix is something particularly pl close to my heart. I like to be able to see a high level of first time fix. There's nothing worse than um, if I if I take the, the washing machine for the sake of argument, if you phone up the uh, the service desk and you say, hey, look, I've got a problem with the washing machine. It doesn't work. Da, 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 da. If that person can solve that issue there and then on the phone and you can move on to your, your next thing, that's brilliant. That's good customer service. If that person is unable to fix it and they need to either refer to a client or somebody needs to come around or there's some kind of there's an extra level. That's OK as well, but it's still not quite as good as somebody being able to fix it there and then on the phone. So I quite like to see high levels of first time fix. Time to answer is another area I'm really keen on on seeing uh, metrics around. Perhaps you have a contract in place that will say um, we aim to provide a, um, a, a time to answer metric of X number of rings or within X amount of time post the IVR or X time from the point of IVR to answer. Whatever it is, I, I definitely like to see that there's a good um, uh, and helpful metric there around time to answer. Abandonment rates as well kind of dovetail into that. I spoke earlier around mean time to acknowledgement, the importance of acknowledging back to your customer Yes, we've, we recognise there's a problem. We've, we've received your request, incident, change, you know, whatever it, whatever it may be. It's trying to have some kind of metric in place that sets the expectation back to your customer. We haven't fixed it, but yes, we know about it and we're on it is, is how I like to, to kind of see the, the, the meantime to acknowledgement. And again, in contracts, you'll, you'll see this around that they will, the, the, you know, Either your customer or a service provider will have something around the mean time to acknowledgement. And I like to see that as a high number, a very high 90s um, type, type of number. The obvious ones that you would always see in reporting and metrics is your um, uh, time to resolution for your P0s, P1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 5s. Customer satisfaction, again, perhaps there's something in there that um, says... Um, in your contract, every time you resolve and close an issue, a questionnaire might go out to a customer and you aim to achieve X percent in terms of a level of, of satisfaction. Um, the, other, the other point I, I always like to see as well within the, uh, the service desk metrics, and it, and it kind of comes from a governance and oversight perspective as well, is if you have the change module enabled in your ITSM tool, it's good to get reporting information around what are the types of changes, what, what are the requests for changes that are coming through, how many emergency, how many standard, how many normal type, type changes. Likewise for assignment groups, really useful to see data around which are the busiest assignment groups within the ITSM tool. Is it the database team, is it networks, is it Wintel, is it application? Um, uh, you know, whatever whatever it is, it's it's good to have those metrics. Other governance and oversight metrics I'm very keen on are hop counts. So how many times has a ticket gone into the service desk function and then it's hopped from group one into group two, then group two into group three. And it, it kind of plays this game of it just bounces around because everyone's saying, no, nope, it's not us. No, nope, it's not us. And that's not great from a customer perspective and it's not great from your own perspective in terms of running a, a service desk function because that ticket's just go, going round in, 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 into the um, round, so bad assignment. Also, aging tickets, it's good to see and have a breakdown in terms of the number of tickets by age. How many are over a week old? How many are over two weeks? How many over a month? How many over six months? Um, you know, and that does start to raise questions around how can a ticket be more than six months old? I've worked in organisations where part of my responsibility was to sharpen up the IT service desk function. And one of those activities was around ageing tickets. And interestingly, a lot of those tickets um, 
were um were old i think there was there was a few hundred that were over six months old which which was ridiculous when as i analyzed it as i looked at it some of those tickets were old because they'd been assigned into a resolver group that didn't exist anymore there was there wasn't a team there so it went into a pot if you like a, a subject matter expert pot but nobody was in that pot the, the team had kind of been disbanded and that system hadn't been used anymore likewise there were tickets in there that um, talked about yes my password is expired can you reset it as I dug down you would find well this person left six, left six months ago so clearly um, you know some some of the data is nonsense but aging tickets is a really good way of, uh, of just keeping on on top of uh, your, your governance and oversight um, as we approach the end there's a couple of um, uh, points I just really want to reiterate in terms of the service desk function, it's really important you don't forget it's about value co-creation. So service desk staff, they need to be trained, they need to be competent in a number of areas, and it's not just technical. They have to be clued up in business areas as well. So key skills that I look for in service desk staff is empathy. It's analysis, prioritization skills. Are they a good communicator? Do they have a good level of intelligence when it comes to emotion? Do they really understand what that incident is about? Not just in terms of the technical perspective, but from a business perspective. I spoke earlier about where I've recruited a first line agent from within the business. They weren't a technical person. They actually were from the customer retention team so they understood the impact if a ticket came through and it said this xyz system isn't working they understood firsthand whoa, whoa, whoa hang on i know what that means on on the on front line um so it's really important people don't just have technical skills they need those customer service skills they need those business skills as well to be able to make the right the correct action to get things resolved and it's and that combination is processes, it's people, it's knowledge and it and it's skills. Parting thoughts around the service desk practice within the service management practice for ITIL4. When you're thinking about your ITSM tool, it makes sense to consider a best of breed. Really think through not just the immediate requirements, but the requirements for the future. Does it integrate? What about all these different tools? What about all these other different practices? Those are the questions you should be asking. I've mentioned about the CX and the UX and the, the perception element that that, um, that brings. It is so important. Your service desk is your front of house. Your customers will engage with you and they will um, judge you by how good your service desk function is. Like it or not, there's the, there's an, a harsh reality there as to your user base are going, are going to um, have a strong influence, there's going to be a strong perception of how good is IT based on, on the service desk function. So really digest that, think that through. Do you have good QA activities in there? Or do you have the right people with the right attitude? Um, uh, do they have empathy? Are they good communicators? Do they have good levels of emotional intelligence? Are they a good listener? You know, are they continually interrupting users and going, no, 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 I, I, you, you need to do this. Think through that, and I, I really can't over um, uh, emphasize the importance of that. But regardless of how you do it, however you do the, the, the service desk function, remember it's about delivering value and it's supporting real people. Remember Dave from accounts, it's Dave from accounts. It's not incident one, two, three, four, five, six. So finally, parting uh, point really here would be about, it is about people, it's about customer experience. And um, I always go back to this point where I recruited somebody who was who actually then went on to be an IT service desk manager in another organization. That person was from a business customer retention team. They weren't an IT person. They understood the importance of the customer service experience and the impact on when some of these issues came through, what it actually meant 
from a business perspective. Do not underestimate that. Okay, thank you very much. Please do subscribe. I will continue to post um, information and uh, uh, my real life experiences around ITIL and ITIL 4 in particular. Thank you.